In this video, I'm going to go through solutions to part 111 exercises data types. As with all the exercise videos, I recommend that you attempt all of these before watching the solutions given here. All this code is going to work in Octave unless otherwise mentioned. All right, let's get to it. How much memory does a 5x7 matrix of singles occupy? Answer in a comment. Check your work by writing such a matrix and checking the workspace. All right, so let's just check our answer right now. No need to try and guess. Pretty much any old matrix will do, doesn't matter the values that I put inside of it as long as I remember the singles function to convert it to a matrix of singles. Except the function name is single, not singles. There we go. Checking the workspace, 140 bytes. Now could we have figured that out on our own? Yes we could have, it's simply 5 times 7 times 4. And how did I know that? Well, because a double occupies eight bytes and a single is half as large, and it's a five by seven. So we just multiply them all together. The following comes from page 404 of MATLAB for Engineers 5th edition. If you cannot see all of the columns that I can see in my workspace right here, what you need to do is you need to click on this little circle with a down arrow in it, and then go to choose columns and make sure the appropriate columns are selected from the menu here. Is there a difference in the amount of memory occupied by the following matrices A and B? Answer in a comment. And let's try to answer this without running the code. So here's A, it's got a variety of exotic values in it. It's got pi, it's got 10 million, it's got 10 to the 40th power, whatever gigantic number that is, 3 to the 11th, E, and 1000, as well as 3, 15, and 4. And then this other matrix B just has elementary school numbers. But are these matrices actually different sizes in memory? Well, the answer to that is no. They have the same size in memory. They both take up 72 bytes because they are both three by three matrices of doubles. It doesn't matter the value, right? We get a box that's big enough for any double and then we put whatever double we have inside of it. Could we change the size of the memory used based on the size of the value? Yes, but the computer engineers who designed our modern computers made the decision that that was too much trouble and not worth it. Because then we'd have to also store in memory how much memory is occupied by each variable instead of just knowing that like, oh, it's a double, it occupies 64 bits. Do we need all of those bytes to represent the number four? No, but we're gonna use them anyway. Because the overhead, the extra memory usage of having to keep track of how much memory that variable uses versus how much memory that other variable uses, that's just too much work. So we're going to have this consistency, and there are some limitations to that consistency, but there's also a lot of simplicity to be gained. How does MATLAB handle conversions when the value is outside of the range of the type being converted to? Answer in a comment. And then there's some code that I believe is actually copied from the lessons in one of the previous videos. I think the earliest one in that part 110 document. But the answer to this is basically MATLAB rounds to the closest number that can be represented in whatever you're converting to. Now in terms of octave, the table function won't work right here, but octave users, you could literally just delete the word table and then all this code will work. And I've got a three by three matrix up here and only one of the values is quite large. The rest of them are single digit. And by default, it's a double, so this is redundant. But what if I convert it to single? What if I convert it to eight bit integers? What about 16 bit integers? And display all of those out. And let's see what our results are. Remember, this is the original. All right, so there's the original right there. That's how it gets displayed out. Now, when we convert to the single data type, this number is too large to be represented. Now this is, I mean, I wouldn't say this is the closest number that MATLAB could have rounded to. So that comment I made about like, oh, it just converts it to the nearest number in the representation being used is not entirely true. And I shouldn't have said that because here it uses its representation of infinity because singles can't represent a number this large. And infinity, like you're not close to infinity. Like that's, I mean, we're not in a calculus class. We're not talking about that sort of thing. So I disagree with this implementation choice. I think that at the very least, to be consistent with all the other conversions, MATLAB should have converted this to the largest non-infinity single type number that is available to MATLAB. And I'm not exactly sure what that is. Um, I guess we could just run real max single and find out. Yeah, so it's pretty close even. It's 3.4 times 10 to the 38th, but not 10 to the 40th. 
Anyway, when converting to an 8-bit integer, that 10 to the 40th power is just 127, because 127 is the biggest 8-bit integer. And when converted to an unsigned 16-bit integer, well, it's 65,000 some, because that's the largest unsigned 16-bit integer. Continuing on down with a few more conversions here. Matrix A is type double, but B is type single, using the variables from the previous section, so don't clear out your workspace. What is the type of the result when we sum them together? So basically, what is the type of E? Is it double or single? Uh, I don't remember the answer to this, so I'm just going to run it and find out, and you are invited to do the same. And the answer is single, which I think is unexpected. Because honestly, if you've got a big bucket and a small bucket and you're combining the items in the buckets, wouldn't you rather have a big bucket left over rather than a small bucket? It seems like this is the more dangerous way to convert this to a single here. But that is the choice that MATLAB made. Modify the following to write your own secret message, encrypt it, and print the encrypted version that should be encrypted. Then decrypt it and print the results and the code is copied from uh, the earlier example in one of the previous videos just for fun. And so this is just a Caesar cipher, which is where you take your characters and you add or subtract some number to them, and then you pass that encrypted information to somebody else, and then they do the inverse operation and get the result. And like it says, like it's just, you know, do your own thing for fun here. So, you know, whatever, whatever. And then uh, instead of adding two, oh, I'll add five. I don't know, whatever. And then I'll subtract five down here and let's run it. All right. And so there's my whatever, whatever. And there it is as numeric values. And there it is plus five as text, as characters. And then I'm going to decrypt it back to numbers and then display it out. And I get the message, whatever, whatever. Continuing on down. Modify the following code copied from above. It doesn't mean copied from above. It means copied from the uh, previous document, the part 110, chap 12, then 11 document, to write out all the magic matrices between size 22 and 66 to Excel. And make sure to name your files magic 2x2, XLSX, magic 3x3, and so on. And I just provided baseline code to get us started right here. We're not supposed to say my data. We're supposed to say magic. And then we're supposed to say like, you know, two by two or whatever. So we don't want to start at one. We want to start at two. And by the way, we want to go up to six here. So instead of five, we'll say six. Uh, instead of doing num to string twice, what I'm going to do is just have a uh, temporary variable set equal to num to string. And then what I can do is I think I should just be able to do magic comma temp comma x comma temp uh, and then dot xls x right there and what am i putting into it well i'm not putting a random matrix i'm putting a magic matrix and i'm just going to go ahead and instead of rand matrix here i'm just going to put in magic k and yeah that should do it cool works right there pops up those excel documents in my workspace i don't actually have microsoft office on this computer but you can open those up and verify that I did successfully copy my data into them. Actually, instead of doing that, let's just do this a little bit better and do a CSV, which I can open and run it again. Now it's gonna generate new documents because they have a new file extension. They're now CSV files. Let's open those up. Here's the two by two file in Notepad. And yeah, it looks perfect. One, three, four, two, it's a two by two magic matrix. Here's the six, six, also in Notepad. It works perfectly. Continuing on down, the following comes from MATLAB for Engineers, 5th edition, page 421. Create a 3D array where the first page is a 3x3 magic, the second is all zeros, and the third is all ones. I actually uh, already did this in my examples, and I actually provide the solution right here, so that's a little bit silly. But you could make up a different three-dimensional matrix and put in your own different values, and I encourage you to do so here. Yeah, and then the further questions, I actually already answered these in the video on multidimensional arrays. So I'm just going to continue skimming past that. Oh, wait, oh, there are some extra ones down here. Find all the values in all the rows of column 5, page 2. Okay, so copying from the previous section, but I want all the rows, colon, column 5, page 2. Oh, I didn't actually run the code. Uh, you got to do that before you can index into your 3D matrix here. So let me go up and run this. Nope, what did I do wrong? 
Oh, I actually have a typo in this. I apologize. So I say three by three, three by three, three by three, and then I make five by fives right here. So that is a typo. Um, by the time you see this, that will be fixed on the online document. So I will post a fix to this and now it should work. Great, now it works. And moving on down, we want all the rows of column five, page two. Oh, there's multiple typos in this document. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna have to fix a few things because there's no column five. I don't know if I meant to use a five by five up above and this is correct or the three by three is correct. Um, let's just change this to column three. So we'll change that there. And now that does work, I apologize. So there are the zeros from uh, page two, which is all zeros. I will fix these and upload this in the online document. Find all the values in rows one and three of all the columns on page one. All right, that's a little bit interesting. Let's check that out. So rows one and three, we just put in a vector one comma three for the rows. All the columns, page one. And I run it and there they are right there, a little cramped because of my width. But there they are again, right here. And you can verify that by printing out the whole 3D uh, array. Well, the results from either of these two practice questions, so just the two previous ones that I did here, benefit from a squeeze. Show it. Um, unfortunately, no, the answer is no, they wouldn't, because this is just a three by one right here, and this is just a two by three. So there's no singleton dimensions that need to be removed using a squeeze. So this exercise document, as you can see, is a little bit sloppier than some of the ones from earlier in the course, but that's okay. We're going to move on here. And again, this is a typo of a five right here. Let's call that a three instead. Squeeze function, I don't know, just as a reminder, is literally just squeeze and then whatever you want to give it. Uh, let's come up with an example where the squeeze would actually work, uh, would actually be relevant, I mean. So we need to get something across multiple pages. So let's get rows one and three only of column two across all the pages right here. And we'll display that out and then we'll squeeze it and see what the squeezed result looks like as well. Except that I cleared everything, so you really don't wanna use a clear. Wow, I'm really making the mistakes today. That's okay, um, this can be good practice. So I deleted the workspace, I gotta rerun this to put my three dimensional array back in. All right, and now let's try the squeeze. All right, here it is without the squeeze right here. So it's spread across three pages, but there's only ever one column, right? Three pages, but every single page has two rows and one column. So if we squeeze it, well, it gets squeezed not to be across all those pages. Let's just make it a two by three and put all the columns adjacent to each other in a simple two-dimensional matrix. So that's what squeeze does. Continuing on down. Create a two by two cell array with the character vector hello in row one, column one, with a two by two magic matrix in row one, column two, and with pi in row two, column one, and with a vector of all the multiples of five from five to 100 in row two, column two, then display it out using cell disp. This is a good one. I really like this one to get a grasp on cell arrays. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna name my cell array C, and I'm going to use the cell function to pre-allocate a two by two cell array. And then in my cell array, row one, column one, in the curly brackets, well, I'm gonna set that equal to hello, all right? And then similarly, but different, row one, column two is gonna be a two by two magic matrix. Row two, column one is gonna be pi. And row two, column two is going to be multiples of five from five through 100. And then we're gonna display it all out with cell display. All right, there's hello, there's pi, there's our two by two magic matrix, and there's the multiples of five. Nice. Create a struct with fields name, height, weight, and put the info for a Nintendo character into it. If you're feeling ambitious, create a struct vector and put more than one in it. All right, so here are some Nintendo characters with their names, heights, and weights. And let's create, uh, I'll create a small struct vector uh, to put these values into it. I'm gonna be fancy about it and pre-allocate my whole structure. So Nintendo is going to be a struct where the first column is going to be referred to by the variable name name and the default value for name is gonna be an empty character vector. And then the second column is gonna be height. I'm gonna keep it all lowercase and the default value for that will be zero. And then the third column is going to be weight and the default value for that will also be zero. 
But Nintendo is going to be a vector of one, two, three, four, five values for all the Nintendo characters. I'm not actually gonna put all of them in. And then let's use dot, dot, dot to move this down onto the next line here, make it easier to read. I hope I did this correctly. I'm getting some parse errors. Oh, this is not square brackets. What am I in Java? This is parentheses right here. All right, there we go. That looks good. So there's my Nintendo vector. And then if I want to put in the first character, I'll put in Bowser here. I just say Nintendo.name. Nope, I say Nintendo at position one dot name equals Bowser. And then Nintendo at position, nope, still at position one, but not the name. The height is going to be 310 and the weight is going to be 726. And then you do a very similar thing for our next character here. A little bit of trouble fitting it on the screen. All right, let's put in Mario next. So at position two in the vector, and then let's display out Nintendo and see what it looks like. Ah, it just says that it's a one by five struct. So that's, that's not particularly interesting. Let's say Nintendo one. All right, there we go. There's Bowser's information when we display out Nintendo 1. How about when we display Nintendo 2? All right, we got Bowser, we got Mario. How about when we display Nintendo 3, which doesn't really have any information in it? Well, it's blank. Interesting, it's not using the default values that I, that I told it to use. That's okay, though. Uh, these might actually be, this might be an empty vector of type character, empty vector of type double. Um, it's a little bit hard to tell without uh, putting them into a variable. All right, and I think the rest is just some uh, questions to answer in the comments. How many bits are in a byte? The answer to that is eight, although I think I'm funny with this uh, option right here. True or false? Doubles occupy twice as much memory as singles. That's true, that's where they get their name from. True or false? There are real numbers that cannot be represented by doubles between each of the reals that can be represented. Yes, that is true. We can always find new real numbers between any two real numbers that can be represented just by extending the decimal places of those numbers. True or false, there are integers that cannot be represented by int type variables between each of the integers that can be represented. That is false. I mean, we can represent one, two, three, four, you know, whatever. Is there an integer between three and four? No. There are no gaps in the integer representation, at least not of the integer type. Int 32, parentheses 5, divided by int 32, parentheses 6, results in what? A double, this value right here, a rational, 5 over 6, an int 32 with the value of 0, or an int 32 with the value of 1. The answer to this is D, because 1 is the int 32 that is closest to 5 over 6. And we can test this out very briefly, putting it in the command window and actually doing the division. And there's the one right there as type int 32. True or false, a character char is simply an interpretation of an integer or a binary value really. Uh, that's true. You can probably tell by how I have to specify the question, but yeah, everything in a computer is some interpretation of a binary value and characters more than most are very close to integers and integers are very easy to represent in binary. The eight in 2,389 represents what? So this is getting back to that number systems video that I did earlier. And what I'm trying to get you to look at here is 80, right? The eight doesn't represent eight. It represents eight times 10 to the first power. Three doesn't represent three here. It represents three times 10 to the second power, two times 10 to the third power, nine times 10 to the zero power. Right? That's what each of these different digits represents. Their context, their placement in the overall number matters. The second one from the left in the binary number 1100 represents what? Well, this zero represents zero times two to the zero power plus zero times two to the first power plus one times two to the second power, or in other words, four. This one represents one times two to the third power, or in other words, eight. But the correct answer here is C. It's uh, the four right there. Converting a matrix to a sparse matrix can reduce memory usage if most of the matrix values are zero, most of the matrix values are the same, the matrix is square, the matrix has singleton dimensions. B is the correct answer. A, I mean, arguably is true, but B sort of is the more general thing, right? 
A and B are, are your answers here, but B is more correct because it's more general and it includes the situation of A. Matrix does not have to be square to be sparse. That's not a requirement. And singleton dimensions don't really matter unless you're using the squeeze function. Cell arrays and structures are useful for what? Locking in variable values, finding a use for curly brackets, ha ha ha, that's just a joke. Storing different data types together is the correct answer. If a variable is accessed by the name data.vals, then that variable is most likely, it's most likely a structure, right? This is how we get access to the fields. That's the technical name for variables that are held within the variable of a structure. And so data is a structure type variable that has other variables inside of it. Those variables are known as fields. And we are accessing using the dot, the variable inside the field inside named vals. As opposed to a variable is accessed by the name data curly bracket one, then that variable is most likely, and when it says that variable, it's referring to data. Data is most likely a cell array because we access cell arrays using curly brackets. The squeeze function will reduce a three-dimensional matrix of size one by four by six to a matrix of size what? And the correct answer is a four by six. And you can test that out for yourself. And that wraps us up for this video. Sorry for the roughness, but I will make some of those little typo fixes on the part 111 document that's uploaded to my Google Drive, which you can access through the link in the video description. All right, I'll see you next time. Bye, folks.